Reversible transactions on Ethereum, ERC20R and ERC2721R. Now, this isn't exactly what everybody, I think, wants to hear. Um, I think when I was seeing people talk about this on Reddit and on Twitter, and I think there was some miscommunications. People read reversible transactions on Ethereum, and they're like, oh my God, it's, it's Ethereum, it's the devs reversing transactions. No, while yes, technically Vitalik has said that they could in the case of a bad hack. And we've seen, you know, historically that they have with the DAO, right? Um, this isn't that. This is actually something completely different. Um, what it has to do is with the idea of actually being able to build a token that allows for reversible tra transactions on top of the blockchain. So on a, I guess you could even like, you could even say this, like, I think this is kind of cool. Like, because it's like, you don't have to use it, but it's there if you want to use it or need to use it. Right. Which is kind of interesting. The, the play though, where it gets a little questionable is what it'll be used for. Because of course, the first thing that everybody starts talking about is utilizing it to reverse transactions of like attacks on different bridges. And while I understand that from a financial perspective and protecting the individual, I do feel like this could put Ethereum, specifically the tokens built on top of Ethereum, into a slippery slope situation. The immutability of blockchain transactions is both a blessing and a curse. BAYC phishing, poly network attack, Harmony Bridge compromise, Ronin theft, $14 billion of crypto stolen in 2021 alone. These and so many more are undeniable thefts, but there's no undo button. Example, credit card payment reversals. And not everyone has a jump crypto to bail them out if needed. But what if there was a reversible type of token? This is the question that a few of us at Stanford, Dan Bonin, or yeah, Bona, not bone in, bone in. <laughs> uh, Quinchin Wang and I have been working uh, to answer over the past few months. We designed opt-in token standards that are siblings to ERC-20 and ERC-721 and support reversing transactions when there is sufficient evidence to prove or to merit it wrote a paper about them and implemented some prototypes. We call these token standards ERC-20R and ERC-721R respectively. Now you may be thinking reversible tokens, doesn't that just defeat the purpose of blockchain? Obviously this is uh, a biased article to be clear. So this is coming from the people that developed them, but they say no. And here's why it isn't meant to replace ERC-20 tokens or make Ethereum reversible. It simply allows short time windows post-transaction for thefts to be contested and possibly restored. Note that a transaction is only freezable for a short amount of time, say three days, before it becomes irreversible. For most of their lifetime, ERC-20R funds are irreversible. In an exchange, swapping between two reversible tokens is instantaneous. If a freeze is requested on one side, it would be possible to get funds reversed from the other side, no matter whether the reversible time period has elapsed. However, exchanging a reversible token for a non-reversible token may. So to protect themselves from reversals, the exchange might finalize the swap only after the reversible time window has elapsed. This would mean that reversible to non-reversible swaps would have delay until the funds are irreversible. Thus, once a couple major tokens become reversible, there is great pressure on other tokens to become reversible as well. Depending on the implementation, it's possible to implement liquid assets for, uh, for which the reversible time period is passed. For example, liquidate assets you receive, received three days ago. In this case, there would not be a delay between your reversible tokens and non-reversible tokens. So what they're saying is basically with adoption, you would end up forcing other tokens if you had a large token. Let's say, um, let's say Ape decides to adopt this, right? Well, Ape token has a bunch of pairs, more pairs than a lot of other. Actually, maybe even a better example of this would be like DAI or a stable coin, right? 
Why? Well, because it has a bunch of pairings with everything else on the network. And if it was utilizing this standard, basically it would force any of your swaps with any other tokens that are not reversible to wait essentially this three day period before it would go through, which would, if on a large enough token, like something like DAI, a stable coin, would influence other tokens to essentially adopt it so that the actual transfer could go through faster. That's how I understand it. So it goes through a basically a, a diagram of how it works. The victim requests the freeze, governance contracts, blah, blah, blah. It comes over to here and it freezes on the ERC-20. And I suppose that is essentially it. So it says, suppose an attacker steals funds from a victim. The funds may be further moved to other addresses, such as in figure one below. I think that's supposed to be below this. Anyways, the following would happen. Victim requests a freeze on the stolen funds. The victim posts a freeze request to a governance contract, along with the relevant evidence and some stake. The contested transaction must be somewhat re recent. There is a fixed reversible time period, three days like we read above, I think. Judges accept or deny freeze requests. A, a decentralized quorum of judges vote to freeze the asset or not. This deliberation period should take a day or two at most. If they reject the request, the process stops there and the victim loses their stake. If they accept the request, the governance contract will call freeze on the ERC-20R contract. Then it would execute the freeze. Now, I'm seeing a couple issues here already, um, but we'll kind of talk about those in a second. So for NFTs, it simply blocks the NFT from being transferred. For ERC-20R, it will trace down the stolen funds and disallow those funds to be transferred. Note that the account owner can still transact with others as long as their balance stays above the frozen amount. This process can become complicated, as I will explain in the next section. But trial. Both sides can then present evidence to the decentralized set of judges. Eventually, the judges reach a decision, at which point they instruct the governance contract to call either the reverse or reject reverse functions on the impacted ERC-20R contract. If reject reverse is called, the freeze on the disputed assets is released. The trial may be lengthy, possibly taking several weeks. And if applicable, the reverse function sends the frozen assets back to the victim. When stolen assets rarely simply sit uh, in one place. Uh, so the attacker often moves it hot potato style from one account to another. In this case, the attacker could even monitor the mempool and move the assets in a front running transaction if they see a freeze request incoming. Our solution to avoid this scenario is by conducting the entire freeze and its calculations on chain in one single transaction so that the attacker can outrun can't outrun the freeze. Here's the problem. Eventually this gets gamed, I think. Um so in order for it to basically be successful, it all has to be carried out on chain in a single transaction. And then we have like way too many other con uh, like smart contract pieces here that are like put into place plus we're talking about trying to interfere with MEV at the end of the day too. I am I mean like I, I don't know if it actually decreases the amount of vulnerabilities on Ethereum or increases the amount of vulnerabilities on Ethereum. From a from a quick glance, I feel as if it increases the amount of vulnerabilities on Ethereum as far as getting into more trouble. But let's go ahead and continue. So you can't just disable every account that has touched the assets. So how do we decide what and who to freeze? If it's an NFT, freezing is fortunately pretty simple. Just see who currently owns the NFT and freeze that account. However, the divisible nature of money makes freezing from ERC-20s much more complicated. The funds could be split among dozens of accounts thrown into an anonymity mixer like Tornado, 
or exchanged into another digital currency. If it goes through many accounts, at least some of those will be tied to the hacker, but some may very well be innocent or merchants who provided a legit service in return for payment. It is possible to always correctly, uh, or it is impossible to always correctly discern the guiltiness of each account. Thus, we have provided a default freezing process for tracking and locking stolen funds. And it assures that assuming no burns, enough assets will be frozen to cover the theft amount. That's another problem, <laughs> the burn, right? So in all of these transactions, like a ton of it's getting burned back and forth due to EIP 1559, which is kind of hilarious. So even to like provide it back, you do end up in a position where you're just burning a portion of the ETH. Plus the fees that you're paying to the validators, you also have to worry about. So um, it should say, um, assuming no burns and of course accounting for the, the uh, fees of the transaction. An account's funds will be on, uh, only be frozen if there's a direct flow of transactions from the theft and the algorithm runs in reasonable runtime complexity with respect to the transaction graft. And then you have a judiciary system. So the more ambiguous piece of this puzzle concerns the decentralized quorum of judges. Who are these judges and how do they vote? How do they get rewarded? These logistics are ultimately up to the governance, AKA whoever creates the instance of the ERC 20 R uh, or 21 R 721 R in our paper. We explore how to discourage the judge dishonest and bribery reward mechanisms and more. So we stress that judges cannot add transactions or arbitrary mo arbitrarily modify the values of one's balance. And this is where, you know, I, I talk about earlier, you're adding in more issues. So this is at the token level. So if ape, like ape token, ape coin decides to implement this on their token, you're in a position where ape coin decides it with their governance on how this will actually be governed, right? And only in the case that the funds of your, your ape coin funds are stolen. So if you're going through like a bridge and you're bridging to essentially something that doesn't support it, not necessarily that, but then that's why you have the three day lockup, which means that you have from a UX perspective, uh, just a, a, a nightmare of swapping between tw seven or 20 R and ERC 20 contracts back and forth. And then you're, uh, you have to go and now what, like now that that's implemented, you need to go research every single token on the Ethereum blockchain and figure out how their governance works for this, this is essentially this, this spe specific contract, like the ERC 20 R stuff. And if it's fair and balanced and blah, 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 and every token individually can change, like it just sounds like an absolute nightmare to research and figure out if, if I should even be utilizing any token uh, that's utilizing it, right? Like, like I gotta go, like, I don't know. It seems extremely stressful to me. Uh, I feel like it's just adding a ton more, but it's an interesting concept at the end of the day to add reversible transactions onto the blockchain. If we were going to talk about reversing transactions, where do you want to put it on? Like, you know, not on the layer one chain. So I guess, well, I don't know. I guess it is on the layer one chain. So I'd, I'd rather maybe see this separated out maybe as a processing system, a transaction processing system. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think about this in general. I did want to primarily cover it because like I said, it was being misinterpreted, right? Essentially at the end of the day, what I was noticing is people were saying, oh no, like you can reverse transactions on Ethereum. I'm like, first of all, no, you can't yet. Second of all, that's not exactly what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is basically reversible transactions of a token. And specifically that token would have to be developed for. So. It's not all doom and gloom to be completely clear. In fact, like it's the opposite of that. I just think like at the end of the day, if I'm looking at the ERC 20 R, I think that there are, it does create more attack vectors. And because of the government governance being put into the hands of each individual token, I think that it adds for like basically a whole other set of nightmares involved in governance. But that's it. That's about all there is. It, it's like when you are constantly improving technology in general, 
yes, like there's going to be more comp like more complications added onto it. So I, I understand that point of view. Um, it's just like when I read it, I'm like, oh man, this sounds rough. Thanks for checking out this clip from the Crypto Mining Show. You can check out the full episode here or more crypto content down here. Also, I'd like you to check out my locals page at sonofatech.locals.com where you can become a member for free or choose to be a $5 a month supporter that unlocks additional content.